Surely you've heard of a 5-step plan before. You've probably also heard of a 12-step plan to deal with alcoholism or other drug-related treatments. But have you ever heard of a 39-step plan? No? Well, neither have I, because that sounds absolutely dreadful. Who would want to take that many steps just to try and deal with just about anything? So don't take the 39-step plan. Take this shortcut. But wait, how does that pertain to this game? You'll find out shortly. Actually, it'll take quite a while, but you'll find out. Hi, you folks. Fruit and Doggy here again, back to the 39 steps, and we're just about to head out, possibly to catch the bad guys before they get away. <coughs> oh, yeah, if we've been so good at disguises thus far. Master class, I say, I say. Other burr noises. Now, I've already done tweets and chirps. Swooshy, swooshy, swooshy. To the hotel. I mean, it was so exciting. It's like, oh man, we're going, we're going. Slowing it back down. <laughs> a pink and blue June morning found me at Bradgate looking from, <coughs> looking from the Griffin Hotel over a smooth sea. The light chip on the cock sands seemed the size of a bell buoy. What are the cock sands? A couple of miles farther south and much nearer the shore, a small destroyer was anchored. Ouch. Ah, there we go. Well, there's the destroyer. Am I hearing people mumbling on a ship? Be quiet! We're trying to enjoy a nice meal here in the inn. Scape had been in the Navy and knew the boat. He told me her name and her commanders, so I sent off a wire to Sir Walter. Scape knows the people who own this boat. I mean, does that matter? This boat? The light, <coughs> the light ship on the cox. No, oh, gosh darn you! The light ship on the cox sand seemed to size. I already, I already read that. <coughs> after breakfast, Scafe got from a Scafe. After breakfast, Scafe got from a house agent a key for the gates of the staircases on the rough. Staircases. Yeah, that's right. I walked with him along the sands and sat down in a nook of the cliffs while he investigated the half dozen of them. I didn't want to be seen, but the place at this hour is quite deserted, and all the time I was on that beach, I saw nothing but the seals. Heard them a lot, too. It took him more than an hour to do the job. He looked at six staircases, and it took him more than an hour. Am I missing something? Everything depended on my guess proving right. He read aloud the number of steps in the different stairs. 10, 24, 35, 42, 47, and 21, where the cliffs get lower. Oh, and 39. Scaife, we have them. I like how it came the last one. Oh yeah, I did count one that had 39. Whoa, I was really getting worried there for a minute. We hurried back to the town and sent a wire to McGallifrey. I wanted half a dozen men, and I directed them to divide themselves among different spe eh, different specified hotels. Then Scape set out to prospect the house at the head of the 39 steps. And you make things a little too obvious, they're going to catch win, huh? He came back with news that both puzzled and reassured me. The house! The house was called Trafficker Lodge and belonged to an old gentleman called Appleton, a retired stockbroker, the house agent said. Only three servants were kept, a cook, a parlor maid, and a housemaid. The cook was not the gossiping kind and had pretty soon shut the door in his face, 
But Scave said he was positive she knew nothing. Perfect. They were just a the sort that you would find in a respectable middle class household. And Mr. Appleton was there a good deal in the summertime and was in the residence now. Had been for the better part of a week. Scaife could pick up very little information about him, except that he was a decent old fellow who paid his bills regularly and was always good for a fiver for a local charity. Ah, very nice. Next door, there was a new house building, which would give, <coughs> which would give, give good cover for observation. And the villa on the other side was the lit, and his garden was rough and shrubby. Man, that's that's good to know. <coughs> I borrowed Scape's telescope, and before lunch, 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 went for a walk along the rough. I kept well behind the rows of villas and found a good observation point on the edge of the golf course. On the edge of the golf course. Four! <laughs> until I got beaten by a golf ball. Then I realized that was a terrible place to stand watch. Thirty-nine steps. Now they're just beating over my head, I tell ya. I observed someone leave the house and saunter along the cliff. I saw it was an old man wearing white flannel trousers, a blue serge jacket, and a straw hat. He carried field glasses and a newspaper. Again, the obsession with clothing. He sat down on one of the iron seats and began to read. Very suspicious. Sometimes he would lay down the paper and turn his glasses on the seat. He looked for a long time at the destroyer. The only thing out there. I watched the elderly man for half an hour till he got up and went back to the house for his luncheon when I returned to the hotel for mine. Mmm, very suspicious as old man eating lunch at the same time I did. This decent commonplace dwelling was not what I had expected. <coughs> That man might be the bald archaeologist of that horrible moorland farm. Or he might not. He was exactly the kind of satisfied old bird you would find in every suburb and every holiday place. If you wanted a type of the perfectly harmless person, you would probably pitch on that. Yeah, old man tend to be considered pretty harmless. Especially retired. After lunch, I perked up, for I saw the thing I had hoped for and had dreaded to miss. Another boat! Ho ho! Right click. Oh, yes, I do. Her name was the Erin Day. Skate said she was, fast she was a fast boat for her build and that she was pretty heavily engineered. Scape and I went down to the harbor and hired a boatman for afternoon's fishing. Man, they sure like their fishing. About four o'clock I made the boatman row us around the yacht, which lay like a delicate white bird, ready at a moment to flee. One of the men was polishing the brass work. I spoke to him and got an answer in the soft dialect of Essex. Another hand that came along passed me the time of day in an unmistakable English tongue. <coughs> our boatman had an argument with one of them about the weather, and for a few minutes we lay on oars close to the starboard bow. It's gonna rain, I tell you! No, sunny! It's gonna be sunny all the rest of the evening. Then the men suddenly disregarded us and bent their heads to the work as an officer came along the deck. He was a pleasant, clean-looking young fellow, and he put a question to us about our fishing in very good English. Hey, we like to fish anyway, you know? But there could be no doubt about him. His close-cropped head and the cut of his collar and tie never came out of England. I know Germans! Man, such racist profiling. 
In the hotel, I met the commander of the destroyer, to whom Scaife introduced me, and with whom I had a few words. I don't trust Germans. He didn't really know what I was meaning, what I, what I meant when I said that, but it's all he needed to know. Then I thought I would put in an hour or two watching Trafalgar Lodge. Hmm, staking out is so fun. Oh, can I? Oh, here we go. Tennis? They played with tremendous zest, like two city gents who wanted hard exercise to open their pores. They shouted and laughed and stopped for drinks when a maid brought out two tankards on a salver. My gosh, can you believe that? You couldn't conceive a more innocent spectacle. I rubbed my eyes and asked myself if I was not the most immortal fool on earth. Mystery and darkness had hung about the men who hunted me over the Scotch moor in aeroplane and motor car, and notably about that infernal antiquarian. It was easy enough to connect those folk with a knife that pinned scudder to the floor and with fell designs on the world's peace. But here were two guileless citizens taking their innocuous exercise and soon about to go indoors for a humdrum dinner where they would talk of market prices and the last cricket scores. The thing that worried me was the reflection that my enemies knew that I got my knowledge from Scudder, and it was Scudder who had given me the clue to this place. If they knew that Scudder had this clue, would they not be certain to change their plans? I had talked confidently last night about Germans always sticking to a scheme, but if they had any suspicions that I was on their track, they'd be fools not to cover it. Why would they think you're on their track? Last they knew, they got away with a murder. They even got away with sneaking an agent in. It's like, in plain body double. <laughs> I had been making a net to catch vultures and falcons, and lo and behold, two plump thrushes had blundered into it. But hey, that makes a pretty good stew, I've come to believe. Well, no, you wouldn't roast. You wouldn't stew birds. You'd probably roast them. Presently, a third figure arrived. A young man on a bicycle. My bicycle that I abandoned. He was welcomed riotously by the players. You all right there, Percy? Yes, you're looking a little hot under the collar. I've got into a proper lava. This will bring down my weight and my handicap, Bob. I'll take you on tomorrow and give you a stroke a hole. Ho 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 They all went into the house and left me feeling a precious idiot. I would rather have walked into a den of anarchists, each with his browning handy, or faced a charging lion with a pop gun then enter that happy home of three cheerful Englishmen and tell them that their game was up. I thought the game was already up for everybody. But then I remembered old Peter Pionar. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was the best scout I ever knew, and before he had turned respectable, he had been pretty often on the windy side of the law. Peter once discussed with me the question of disguises, and he had a theory which struck me at the time. He said, barring absolute certainties like fingerprints, mere physical traits were very little use for identification if the fugitive really knew his business. The only thing that mattered was what Peter called... Amosphere? Amosphere. Those chaps didn't need to act. They just turned the handle and passed into another life, which came as naturally to them as the first. Peter used to say that it was the big secret of all the famous criminals. Um, I think it's just kind of the famous secret of all... I think it's kind of the, uh... It's not even so much that, it's just... Really wicked evil people can come off as just regular Joes. They can be the most horrendous serial killer, but, you know, to their friends and their family, they seem like a perfectly affable, lovable fellow. It's just part of their 
just a uh, appalling lack of empathy, their disgusting double-sidedness. This recollection gave me the first real comfort I had had that day. Not the bed, not the food, not having a good police fellow with me and it's like, hey, wait, we figured things out. It's like, no, it was a conversation from somebody I had years ago. <coughs> Peter had been a wise old bird and these fellows I, f I was after were, <coughs> were about the pick of the aviary. Again, kind of a weird metaphor. Man likes himself a good couple of birds. It was now getting on for 8 o'clock and I went back and saw Scaife to give him his instructions. I arranged with him how to place his men and then I went for a walk for I didn't feel up to any dinner. It took all my resolution to stroll towards Trafalgar Lodge. <clears throat> on the way I got a piece of solid comfort from the sight of a greyhound that was swinging along in a nursemaid's heels. Boy, how comforting the look of a greyhound. He reminded me of a dog I used to have in Rhodesia before I shot him on accident. Oops. Oh, really? I thought that would have been the climax, but that was just build up and now the last scene will be the climax. Well, maybe there's not much of a loose resolution, but anyways, I'm going to end the recording there. And by the time we get back, I guess we're going over. It'll be the end of the game. <coughs> and all these different extras and stuff, I'm just going to cover in the final video. I'm not going to separate into its own because I don't think it'll take very long to go through it just a minute or two. But anyways, when I see you, I guess we'll be wrapping things up. But, uh... I'll see you around, folks, and as always, Fruit and Doggy, 